Steve, what, what are we looking at today then? Well, I'm slightly concerned by what I'm looking at because you seem to be in a different location. Have you expanded? Is there something odd going on? And you're I'm, stroking something like a Bond villain there. Down yeah, down I'm, there. I'm puppy sitting. So <laughs> ah. this is Marley. Hello, Marley. Say hello, Marley. Say hello to everyone. There we go. Yeah. That's Marley. Marley is a shippu. And unfortunately, I can't leave him alone for very long because he's quite young. So yeah. he's probably going to eat the microphone and everything, but it means that I'm having to do this on Wi-Fi. Well, that's great, because I was wanting to talk about Wi-Fi. We briefly touched on this when we talked about the Wi-Fi hidden node problem, where you've got the access point, and then you've got the two computers that are sufficiently far away from it that they can't talk to each other, they can't see each other's transmissions, but they can both talk to the access point. And we talked about how the access point could configure things by sending the sort of clear-to-send packets out to enable them to communicate without... Uh, colliding with each other when both machines try to transmit at the same time. And I thought we could talk about a few more issues that sort of come up from using wireless networks that you perhaps don't get in the same way if you've got a cable between all the machines. In particular, it's the fascinating sort of relationship between your sort of Wi-Fi speed, distance and time. When we have a Wi-Fi network, we, we know the basics. We have an access point, which is connected to our internet connection via Ethernet usually. Technically, it doesn't have to be, but that's what we tend to use these days. And then it transmits via radio waves, either 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. There are a few variations, but we won't get into that. We'll keep things generic in this video. Uh, it transmits the data to your machine. And we sort of know intuitively from basically uh, having used it that if we are sitting close to the Wi-Fi access point, then generally we'll get a good connection. The speeds are high, but, and I think you've experienced this, Sean, if you get far enough away from the access point, well, the speed tends to drop off until if you get further enough away, you don't get any speed at all and you just lose connection. So I thought we could talk about why Wi-Fi networks have to do that and some of the implications that become because of the way they're managing it. Now, why does the speed have to drop off. Well, I think an easy way to look at it and to make things slightly tricky for sure when he's editing this video, seeing as he's remote and I'm remote, is I've got um, my iPad here and we can see the problem visually. I put some text on the screen of the iPad and hopefully you can see this. If not, Sean's got some superimposition to do. Um, but it says, can you see what it says here, Sean? It's just uh, bleached out on the Skype, I'm afraid. It's all yeah. completely white as far as I can Can see. I sort of bring the uh, brightness down? Oh, yeah. To sort of... Yeah, I can see this text, but it's a bit blurry. So you can see this text is a bit blurry. Now, one way I could get that better for you is to bring it closer. And if I bring it closer to the camera, eventually it's still going to be blurry because I'm not refocusing the camera. I can see words a bit more clearly, but I can't see what they say. Let me just make the text um, bigger. Okay. Um, so we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to make the text oh, now hello bigger. Oh, hello world. Right, yeah, we got it now. Hello world. Hello That's, world yeah, yeah. and things. And in fact, if I was to come back to my um, thing here, if I made the text sufficiently big, back from where I originally started, I increased the size, eventually standing over here, you'd be able to see. Yeah, I mean, notwithstanding the odd reflection, I can see hello world now. We can work that out. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And in many ways, that's what's going on with a Wi-Fi network. When I was far away and the text was small, that's equivalent to us transmitting the data very, very fast. If you were standing where I was, you could read that text fine, but you couldn't because I was far away from the camera and the camera and the Skype connection were sort of reducing the quality of the image. And it's the same sort of thing that's happening with Wi-Fi. We know that the Wi-Fi is transmitted over radio signals, and to do that, it needs to encode the zeros and ones that make up the data packets, the Ethernet frames that are being transmitted into the radio waves. And we'll gloss over how that's done. We'll just keep it general for this video. And I'm sure we can do another video or someone can do a video on all the encoding that's done for that. That's not my area of expertise uh, and things. Um, but we take the data and we encode it into a radio signal that's transmitted. And if we're transmitting the data very, very fast, and we do that by making each symbol of that message well, that's a zero and one, and again, I'm glossing over how that's encoded, each symbol, relatively short amount of time. It's a bit like when we had the small text visually, the sort of the, the bits of the stems of the characters were small. Um, so we made them take up a small amount of time as we transmit it. Now that's fine if you're sitting underneath your Wi-Fi access point. You'll receive the signal and your laptop or whatever it is will be able to decode it and get the original 
zero to one to make up the frame and process the data. There's probably some error correction going on in there as well, just to be able to sort of correct things or at least error checking to so you know if the packet's got corrupted and you can ask for it to be reset. So that's fine if you're there, but as you move away from your access point, then you're still gonna get the signal, but as you move further away from it, the signal level's gonna drop just because of the way that radio waves work, the further away you are from the source, the less power you get. But also, it's not a perfect environment. You've got noise in the radio spectrum anyway from various sources, other Wi-Fi networks nearby or far away, just general background radio noise. If you've got a, an old FM radio and you tune it to an area where there's no station, you can hear the static. That's just the noise of the signal that's there. So you've got the signal which you're transmitting, which is getting less and less in power as you move further away, but you've also got noise there. And there becomes a point where you can detect there is a signal, just like you could see that there was something on the iPad screen, but you can't determine what it is because it's sort of mixed in with the noise. So how do we get around that? Well, we do the same thing as I did with the text. We make the symbols that make up the message bigger. Now we can't make them bigger physically like we did with the text, but we can make them longer in time. And if we make them longer in time, that means it's going to take longer for us to transmit each symbol, which means it's going to take longer for the whole packet to transmit, which means that the data that you're receiving will come in slower. So one of the things that your Wi-Fi access point and your laptop, tablet, phone, whatever it is you're using need to do is negotiate a speed so that when they transmit the data, it's transmitted at a speed that the other end can receive it with enough clarity. There's still noise there, just as you saw that the text was still, wasn't perfectly crisp, but it was sufficiently clear enough amongst the noise, which we simulated with the camera and things, that you could actually get the message. And it's the same thing that you need to do with Wi-Fi. So if your access point's here, and you're three floors up in your studio, then you're going through all different floors, which are going to attenuate the signal, there's noise from other things in there, and eventually you find that you get a, a really slow signal, and it's actually quicker to pick up the USB stick and walk around and deliver it by hand than it is to transmit it over the network connection. On the other hand, if you're downstairs looking after your dog in the lounge, and the Wi-Fi access point is probably somewhere in the same vicinity, you get a rather decent signal, and you can do things, you can watch Netflix, whatever it is you want to do without any problems. Other streaming providers are available, like the BBC iPlayer, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, Discovery. The speed at which we can transfer data over Wi-Fi is inherently related to how far we are from the access point, because as we get further away, we need to transmit things either in a longer amount of time, so that they're clearer to the receiver, because it sort of says, ah, this is slightly higher up now for two seconds, it's shrink time massively, but you get the idea. So this is probably a one or a zero for two seconds. Whereas if it was just sort of half a second, again, trick time to sort of speeds that these things work at, it would be much harder to see what was actually, was that just a bit of noise that I got there? Or was actually one that was being transmitted? You can't tell. On the other hand, if it's at a longer, a higher level for longer, you can receive what the signal is. The other thing you could do, of course, is boost the power up, but you don't really have that option if you're using something like a laptop, because you've got a finite amount of power from the battery, um, the access point, if it boosts the power too much, is going to flood the whole neighbourhood with your Wi-Fi signal. Or you could use a better aerial, but again, the aerials are built into um, the machine and so on. You need to do something which means you can receive the signal clearer than you could before. And the easiest way for the access point and the laptop to do that is to just reduce the transmission speed, make the symbols longer in time, and then you can detect what they are and receive the Ethernet frame, the data packet, with the data that you're interested in. Now, there's an interesting implication of this, because we also need to think about how our computers know whether there's a Wi-Fi network there. So when you open up your laptop, Sean, and you want to connect to a new Wi-Fi, how do you do it? Um, you don't make the dog bark. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you go for a new one, you basically scan the area, don't you? You, you, yeah. you? you click on whatever icon it is on whatever operating system you're using that, you know, see what networks are out there. So presumably they're announcing themselves somehow, are they? Yeah, exactly. So generally, 
unless it's a, a hidden Wi-Fi network, what we do is we see a list of all the Wi-Fi networks that we're interested in, and we just pick the one that we want to connect to. It'll then ask us for some encryption details, the sort of the pre-shared key, or maybe some authentication details, so that we can set up an encrypted session so the data's not transmitted in the clear, at least hopefully, uh, and things. And then they can talk to each other. But the Wi-Fi access point, it does that by sending out what's called a beacon packet. And this basically just announces that the Wi-Fi network is there and is one of these sent out for every different Wi-Fi network that exists. So if your Wi-Fi access point is broadcasting several different Wi-Fi networks for different reasons, like the ones at the university are, you've got edgy roam for general use, you've got specific ones for our robots and things to connect to, which have slightly different setups on them, then it needs to send out a beacon packet for each of what we call the SSIDs um, that describe each of those networks. And so it'll send one out for edgy roam, it'll send one out for the robot related one, and so on. But now think about it. It cannot send them out at the fastest speed, because if it did, and you're sitting three flights of stairs up in your studio, you wouldn't detect it, and so you wouldn't know the Wi-Fi network was there. So how do you think the Wi-Fi access point gets around that? Well, presumably it's got to vary its speed. Yeah. And so actually what the Wi-Fi networks do is when they send out that beaconing packet, they send it at the slowest possible speed that they're set up to do. And that could potentially go as low as one megabit per second. Um, if you're really far away from a, a Wi-Fi network, then you send that at one megabit per second. Does that mean that you're actually seeing um, networks from far, far away, ones that you probably wouldn't even really realistically be able to use? Potentially, yeah. I mean, I remember... Uh, when I moved into my house for the first time, opening up my, uh, this was before I put the Wi-Fi network in, which I did relatively quickly, uh, before things like the bathroom, but that's another story. Uh, I opened up the Wi-Fi tab on my Mac and it was basically the whole screen full of Wi-Fi networks. Every sort of house in the area, you could see a different Wi-Fi network. You could tell who which providers are using based on the SSIDs, still saying BT, Virgin, whatever what network provider they were with and so on. But you could see all these different Wi-Fi's. Chances are most of them you'd be so far away from that even if you knew the credentials you wouldn't get a good signal, but you could just about detect the beacon packets and say, ah, this network is out there. Now the other thing is that you can't just send these packets um, once. You can't just have your access point say, hey, here I am, uh, because if it did that, well, it might get corrupted on transmission, in which case you wouldn't get it, and so you wouldn't know it was there, or you might turn your laptop on after the access point is sent it. So actually that access point sends that beacon packet out several times a second. In fact, it sends it every 102.4 milliseconds uh, and things. Now, put this together, we're sending out a packet every 102.4 milliseconds. It has to be transmitted at the lowest speed possible and it will take up a certain amount of time because it's got data that needs to be in there, sort of what network channel, which part of the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum is it using, what the SSS ID is, various other options that the machines need to communicate and things. So it's about, I think it's about 300 bytes or so the pa these packets are, plus you've got preambles and postambles and frame check sequences so you can make sure that it's sent. So it takes up a certain amount of time. And as that's being transmitted, of course, you can only transmit one packet at any one time. So as that's being transmitted, you can't actually transmit anything else on your Wi-Fi network. And this is why network operators who provide Wi-Fi in public spaces don't like people coming along and using their phone on hotspot tethering. When you turn on hotspot te tethering, whether it's an Android phone or an iPhone, whatever it is, when we turn on the hotspot mode on our phone, this effectively becomes a Wi-Fi network. It becomes a Wi-Fi access point, it's transmitting out uh, beacon packets, and it's either going to be on the same channel as one of your access points, and if you've got a commercial setup, something in a sports stadium or a train station or something, you're probably going to be using all the channels anyway, so the chances that you're transmitting on the same channel as one of their access points is very, very high. It sends out its beaconing packet, and again, it will probably do it at the slowest speed possible, because unless you've tuned it, it'll do it at about one megabit a second. And so suddenly you have the access point beacon packet, then you have your personal hotspot beacon packet, 
and then they're going to be transmitted again in 102.4 milliseconds. And so actually, it doesn't take many personal hotspots or at rogue access points around to actually drag the speed of the Wi-Fi network down to sort of being unusable. I think it's something like 15 extra hotspots, if that sort of order, um, if you're not set them all up properly, can sort of drag the Wi-Fi speed down to absolutely terrible positions. So actually, when you sort of see people saying, don't use personal hotspots here, they're not doing it because they want you to use their Wi-Fi network. Well, they might be because they get money from that, possibly. But it actually really does degrade the performance for everyone. So if, you, if you're trying to use a free Wi-Fi and you realise it's really slow, so you pull your phone out to make a hotspot instead, you're actually becoming part of the problem. Yeah, effectively, yeah. And it's not just that. Even in your home network, if you're sitting uh, with your puppy, um, having a, squat, a Skype conversation here, then you've probably got pretty good signal there. But if you've got someone upstairs working in the studio, also on the Wi-Fi network, who's on a slower network, they're actually going to slow down your connection because their packets are going to take longer in time. And while they're transmitting, you can't transmit at the same time on the same frequency, ignoring sort of MIMO type stuff, which use different frequencies and so on, but that's a simple thing. You can't transmit at the same time until they're done. So if you were to sort of, sort of do a sort of round robin type transmission, you transmit a packet, yours is very, very fast. Then you have to wait for their packet. Then you transmit a very small one. Then you have to wait for their small one. Then you transmit another one and wait for their small one. You end up that most of the time you're sitting there waiting to transmit while the other person is transmitting slowly. They probably don't notice much of a difference because your packets are very, very fast and very, very small. Mm -hmm. But you suddenly find that your network speed is tanked purely because someone else elsewhere in the building is on the same network, transmitting at a much slower speed. Yeah. It's called Psycho Baby, it's, out, it's after Doctor Who, isn't it, right? So it's been a while since I've watched Doctor Who, but the idea is that Doctor uh, Who keeps showing people this blank piece of paper, and it's psychic paper, which means that they see some identification that means something. To and them. in that space, what it's doing is it's looking for extra areas where it can add the nodes to build that graph up. 